Hoffman so that we don't need to go into all his awards and all his other accomplishments. And the one that is you, you most often hear, and you hear it because it's accurate, is came from Senator Moynihan uh, in the 1990s, who said that uh, Floyd Abrams is the most significant First Amendment lawyer of our age. And the other quote that I was giving essentially said that if you ask anybody to name a First Amendment lawyer, they will name Floyd. And if you ask them to name a second one, there usually would be silence. That is the position that he really holds in this extraordinarily important field. Uh, I will make one disclosure. Floyd and I have been very good friends for a long time. We have terrific discussions on just about everything, including very much so sports, even though he's a Yankee fan and I'm a Mets fan, but we get along very, very well. So it's a pleasure, Floyd, to uh, be doing this program with you. Uh, the, there are so many issues that one can take up, but given the fact that we are at a time near an election when, when so many legal issues are coming up that all of you are watching, whether you're lawyers or not. I thought I would take uh, two, maybe three items that are in the news today and that relates, even if not directly to the First Amendment, but certainly to the courts and the Constitution. Um, so let's take the one that uh, everyone has been talking about for two weeks, what they call court packing. Court packing is a negative term, of course. People who are, look at it other ways might call it expansion, enhancement. The words are, are the brand names. Um, but Floyd, I'd like to discuss this with you and ask you, um, first of all, to give a little uh, background as to how this, what, what is this phrase? How did it come to be from the 1930s on? And what do you think is likely to happen? And what do you think should happen if we have a Biden administration with a Democratic Senate and we get to the, we know we have all heard arguments that what Senator McConnell did by you know, not appointing uh, President Obama's appointee four years ago was terrible. And now of course we have a conservative appointee. And then there are other people who say that to even consider adding the number of people to the court could greatly diminish the importance of the court. Do we go from nine to 13? And the next time the Republican wins, win, we go to 17 and 21 and 36. Does that open the door to weakening the institutional importance and role of the court? So those are my broad questions on this topic. Well, let me start back uh, what you referred to at the beginning. Uh, in the 1930s, <clears throat> a very old, a uh, very conservative court uh, struck down as unconstitutional uh, a number of New Deal pieces of legislation uh, with uh, minimum wage laws or, uh, and a variety of other uh, what we would consider now rather modest legislation, uh, which one and again and again the, the court held was unconstitutional. A New York statute, uh, it, it, this goes back, but a New York statute about uh, minimum wages for people that work in bakeries in New York was held unconstitutional as a violation of the right to contract where the conservative court uh, at that time said uh, this interferes with the right of labor and management to work out an agreement. Uh, uh, and uh, so when the Democrats ran, uh, when FDR ran for his second term in 1936, the court was very much an issue. Um, and by 1938, uh, uh, President Roosevelt was furious that, you know, his equivalent of the Affordable Care Act was being held unconstitutional again and again and again. And he came up with the idea of what became known pejoratively as <clears throat> packing the court. Uh, and it was either gonna be by appointing more justices. <clears throat> the constitution says nothing about how many people sit on the Supreme Court. So the Senate has the power then. Senate, you know, signed by the president can make a law uh, increasing the amount of, of justices. The, the notion of doing that was very unpopular. And it was unpopular with Democratic senators, the, the Democrats in those days 
uh, were rooted in the South and rooted in the traditions <coughs> of senators being reelected all the time, having enormous power, uh, even against a very popular president. So in the 1938 election, uh, President Roosevelt went around the country campaigning on this, pack the court, increase the court, find a way uh, so we, we can get my legislation through. <clears throat> and he lost badly. But by that time, what was already beginning and what started to continue was the court becoming more amenable to sustaining legislation of that sort. And there was a phrase used then, uh, a switch in time saves nine. That a member of the court <laughs> switched his vote, affirmed the constitutionality of the sort of statute that he had previously thought or said was unconstitutional and everything was okay again. There hasn't really been any talk since the 30s of extending the amount of people uh, on the Supreme Court. And uh, I think what, what, what clearly led this to, to become even a topic to be discussed is the fact that when President Obama nominated Merrick Garland, a rather centrist a touch conservative, but centrist Democrat, uh, as his nominee for the court uh, uh, in the year that he was leaving uh, the presidency, but not at the at the end of it. Uh, uh, the Senate committee, led by Senator McConnell, simply re refused to interview him or to proceed with the ratification process. Um, that left a, a really a, a sense of fury amongst uh, Democrats, uh, at least amongst Democrats. So now we come to this year and uh, Justice Ginsburg dies just a few weeks ago. Um, and a number of the Republicans senators, including Senator McConnell, who had said, look, why don't we let the public decide back at the time when Obama was nominating someone, why don't we let the public decide by saying who wins the next election? And that president can choose. Nonetheless, uh, this time around, uh, took the step of a very quick nomination uh, uh, on the eve almost, and now, literally the eve of the presidential election. And so Democrats have been asking, what can we do about this? What, how, how do we deal with this? We, we got pushed over under Obama. We got pushed out uh, with, with the new justice. Uh, and so the, the thought has gone around, uh, why don't we just increase the number of people on the court? We can do it if we, take the Senate and have enough votes. Uh, they're the ones, the Democrats believe, who've misbehaved. And, you know, we, this is an outrage. Um, so that's where we are now. Uh, Senator Biden had made it pretty clear, I think, that, that he was certainly in general, not in favor of things like this, that he was an institutionalist uh, and my own sense is that it would take a lot uh, to get him to start down this road, uh, certainly at the very beginning of his presidency, if he should be elected. Uh, but, but that's what court packing, which, which again was the derogatory word <laughs> used in the late 30s about that. That's where the notion of it comes from and what it would be. Do you think, Floyd, that um, <coughs> if, in fact, the Democrats do win and have to consider whether to go down this road or not, uh, is there a possibility that the same uh, pattern, historical pattern that you mentioned of judges one way or the other um, seeing things differently, you know, with good legal reasoning, but nevertheless 
from a political point of view, their decisions may be viewed as being more sensible. Is it possible, you think, that with this court, with the current membership, that the same might happen over a course of two years, let's say, so that if the Democrats um, uh, say, well, we won't do anything immediately, watch and see what happens. Do you think that's a possibility? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I, I really don't think Vice President Biden is, is going to start down this road. Um, I think the most important thing uh, is suggested by your question. If the conservative members of the court try to take the election away from Biden and fail, <coughs> so he does become president, but Democrats are writhing in fury at a series of, of, of decisions, striking out votes from here and there, and otherwise leading at, at least uh, the, the uh, supporters of perhaps President-elect Biden, uh, that would be one thing. Um, I think it may well come into play in considering the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, which is being argued uh, less than 10 days, uh, the less than two weeks, <clears throat> where there are two sorts of issues. Well, one is the issue of that if there is something, is there something uh, constitutionally wrong in the statute, which I think they may well say by a six to three vote. Then the question is, well, what do we do about that? Do we just say, well, all right, that little bit of the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional, or do they say because it's unconstitutional, the whole act falls? Right. Yep. Uh, and if the whole act fell, if we literally uh, in, <coughs> in two months uh, lose Obamacare and there's a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president. Yeah, I think in that case, it might come up very quickly. So let me, um, let me switch to another subject that uh, has come up recently. The question of recusals. Uh, we know that generally judges <coughs> do not sit on cases where they have a personal involvement. What the word personal involvement or interest means you know, can vary, obviously, if you own a lot of stock in a company and you have a major case concerning that company, that would be a case of recusing yourself because you have an interest in the outcome of the case. Uh, but a lot of people are asking the question in regard to our new justice, Justice Barrett. And sometimes they use the word in what I would say is a kind of a loose way. Well, we have a Republican president who has appointed her the Republican president has made no uh, bones about the fact that he's doing so because amongst other things, he would like to get the right result on, on overturning the uh, Affordable Care Act. He would like to get what he considers to be the right result in abortion cases dealing with Roe v. Wade. And he's happy that she has been nominated. Needless to say, in the nomination hearings, Justice Barrett, like all judges say that they will not comment on anything that can come before them. And then people have now unearthed certain things that, uh, or organizations that she belonged to in the past where she signed petition on, on that may relate to, to some of this. So what, are, uh, what are the standards that apply to a Supreme Court judge in regard to laws? Are there any administrative standards? Do the canons of judicial ethics that apply to judges the Supreme Court, or is it a sort of a voluntary notion that we trust their good sense to resolve at the right moment, but that as far as it goes? And also, who initiates a request for recusal, or is it all initiated by judges themselves? A request has already been made to Justice Barrett to recuse herself uh, um, in a case involving the, the presidential election in Pennsylvania. Uh, brought, brought by the, the Democratic Party in a particular part of Pennsylvania. They later withdrew that, uh, uh, but, but it certainly is not everyone's mind. Look, the, the, the general rule, I mean, all this began with the idea that first of all, it's important that justice be done and it's not justice 
if, and the most obvious example is, the, pre, the a judge is taking money from a litigant. Uh, that's a crime. Uh, uh, it's also the sort of thing which would lead uh, to a judge having to not sit. And in the most recent case involving that, quite recent case, uh, a state judge, um, his largest contribution came from uh, a, a man in that community who had a very big case in front of that judge. And the judge did not recuse himself. He was asked to. And the argument was you ought to, at least there's an appearance uh, of, of uh, favoritism here because you gave so much money uh, and it so obviously affected the result. The judge refused to, and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court said that uh, he should have. He should have recused himself because the appearance in that case of, of not being able to be fair was so great that uh, the case had to be retried. Uh, much more commonly in the U.S. Supreme Court, which bear in mind, Nobody can reverse them. They're the final judge of everything that goes before them, short of impeachment. Uh, and they're the final judge of what goes before them. And they're the final judge about when they sit and when they don't sit. So there was a case in which uh, Justice Scalia went uh, duck hunting uh, with Vice President Cheney. Uh, uh, you, you can figure out the years from that. Um, and after the weekend of duck hunting, there was a case brought against Cheney uh, that the court heard. <clears throat> now, it was not a case alleging misconduct by Cheney in his personal capacity. He was the official sued because he headed whatever it is, vice president's head. Um, and Justice Scalia wrote uh, an uh, opinion saying, no, that's not a good enough reason for me to recuse. I have friends. We all have friends here. He said every, every person on this court had a friend who was a politician a uh, or someone that they knew uh, in politics who supported them. And so I won't do it. Now, here we have a situation where I would say, but for statements of the president saying he wanted, he wanted that vote on to decide election related issues. And yes, he wanted that vote to be on for the Affordable Care Act, which is being argued in two weeks. Um, I think, but for that, I don't think anyone would think seriously that there was an argument that Justice Barrett was required to uh, re recuse herself. That said, it's entirely up to the justice, uh, as I said. And, you know, it would, on one level, it would do a lot for her reputation as a new jurist on the court appointed out of this political maelstrom that, that we're all in now, if she didn't sit on it. Um, but one of the problems with that is that that leads to a 4-4, sometime at least, uh, a, a, a decision-making situation which screws up the law and leaves everyone unsure uh, as to what the law is. Uh, uh, I think the answer is no, she won't recuse herself. Um, um, but I, th I think, frankly, a closer case it's not an election case. I mean, obviously, if she hands the election to the president, uh, I think the reputation of the Supreme Court for fairness would, would be damaged uh, forever or for a long, long time. Um, but if it weren't that, suppose it is the Affordable Care Act. That's a case that's been on the docket a long time. Uh, everybody politically 
has positions on that. Uh, she uh, has taken public positions as a private citizen that it was unconstitutional. <coughs> she signed a petition. Now that, that's a case in which a, a responsible jurist on the court might well say, I don't have to recuse myself, but in the interest of justice, because it's important that, that justice appear to be done as well as being done, that I won't sit on the case. Um, uh, who knows? I, I mean, I, I would think certainly the betting is that, that, that she, she will not uh, re recuse herself. Uh, and again, if she doesn't, there's nothing that can happen. But back to the first question, if her vote is the vote, particularly something soon that turns the tide, certainly in the election, um, uh, uh, but even in the Senate, for the Senate and the like, uh, I, can, I could see the, uh, Democrats have trying to do this now. Of course, we have to bear in mind if, if, if President Trump is reelected, it would take two thirds of the House, two thirds of, of the Senate to override or of the Senate to override uh, a veto, which he would certainly uh, make. Uh, so this will only come up with the President Biden and the Democrats controlling the Senate. Doran, we cannot hear you. Okay, in, in, Dor in Doran's absence, go ahead, Mr. Uh, I can give you one more question Doran indicated to me, he might ask, <coughs> which was, uh, what is the difference these days between liberal jurists and conservative jurists on First Amendment cases? I mean, who's saying what uh, about that? And I'd say that the short answer is that in general, this is a very pro First Amendment court. Uh, <coughs> they disagree on some issues involving the, the, the protection of commercial speech, for example. Um, and and uh, uh, certainly in the era of campaign finance, but for the most part in situations in which what is at issue is you know, somebody saying something yeah. which, is, which is viewed as deeply offensive and maybe on the dangerous side, I think that, that this court is likely to continue to, to lean very much in the pro First Amendment, pro free speech, even if it does some harm uh, yeah. sort of way. And uh, by the way, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, no, because I, according to my screen, I was muted and I could not unmute. Uh, but just to pick up on that question, Floyd, then, uh, we've heard a lot in the uh, nomination hearings about originalism as a form, as one of the approaches to constitutional interpretation. And the other side, certainly ones that uh, has been taught in law schools is sometimes called the living constitution, or the emerging constitution, et cetera. When you take those terms and try to apply them to First Amendment jurisprudence, um, I guess my questions are, do they make any sense or do we find that the people who some people would think of as liberal and protective of free speech, like yourself, uh, are in some ways originalists and literalists mm -hmm. in looking at the actual original words of the First Amendment from the, from mm -hmm. the 1790s. Uh, so the notion of originalism, as we've heard it in the last two weeks, falls into the liberal conservative pendulum. Yeah. But when, when you think of an absolute interpretation of the First Amendment right of, of speech, even of the most horrible speech, uh, isn't that a form of originalism and textualism? Well, yeah, I, I mean, this is an area in which, unfortunately, uh, everybody uses the same word to mean different things. <laughs> uh, uh, everybody thinks he's an originalist, says so anyway, 
uh, but but they disagree about what it means. Uh, now, one of the reasons for that is our society was unthinkable at the time the Bill of Rights was was written. Uh, there were no algorithms. Uh, there was no internet. Um, uh, there was no radio. Um, and, and so the court starts out with language, which is for the most part, very broad. Congress shall make no law abridging in the speech area, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Those 45 words are all the constitution says, all the first amendment says about this area. Um, so different judges have viewed it different ways through the years. Some of them have said, let's go back and find out what the framers had in mind. They came out of English law. English law you know, was not terribly supportive of what we would now call First Amendment rights. Um, Justice Thomas is an example of someone who does that all the time. The Supreme Court had a very interesting case a few years ago. California had a law saying that, that uh, video games, which were particularly uh, violent or a sexual orientation uh, could not be uh, purchased by people under the age of 16 without the consent of their parents. Now we're, we're talking here about speech which is protected by the First Amendment. That is to say, you know, not so far, uh, uh, so far down, down the road that, that the court has, has said that it's not protected. But the sort of issue then was, well, no, they're not banning it. The California people who did it said, we're protecting young people. And all we're saying is that they need the consent of their parents. Now, how do you analyze that? Justice Thomas went back to the 18th century and he said in the 18th century, children had no rights. Everything was their parents and indeed their father deciding uh, what they could do and what they could not do. And therefore it was perfectly constitutional uh, in that spirit to say that uh, California is saying that for certain types of, of, uh, of uh, games, uh, you know, deeply uh, filled with, with violence and often racism and often uh, sexual conduct, which may be, which is protected, e even the depiction of it, but not for children. Uh, uh, Justice Thomas said uh, that, that that law is perfectly constitutional. The, the uh, main opinion for the court and written by Justice Scalia, uh, another conservative, but, but a, and, and a self-styled and generally viewed to be an originalist said in substance, this is the easiest case we've had. Children have some rights too. Uh, and the idea of, of saying that they need their parents' consent to buy something which is constitutionally protected <clears throat> uh, goes much too far. And it goes all over the First Amendment uh, boundary line. So that, that's one sort of case in which, it, in which a sort of, well, two originalists, two people to, who said they're originalists. But what Justice Scalia said originalism meant was you, you, you take the language that they used and, and you look at its breadth when they used words that, that are not uh, so easily definable. Uh, I mean, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, how much, uh, what, what do we mean? What's press? Uh, I mean, for example, everyone on the court agreed with something the framers wouldn't have understood. Why is a video game protected by the First Amendment? The whole court said, well, sure it is. It's a means of communication uh, and uh, it, it is speech. 
up-to-date speech, but nonetheless uh, speech. So now Justice Brennan was the one who led the other side in, in years of battling about originalism or that. He said, this is all a farce. You're, you're using the word originalism to do what you want to do, to allow what you want, not to allow what you don't want. The truth, Justice Brennan said, was they used a really broad word. They said freedom of speech or of the press. And they let history decide what, what those came to make sense to mean. They didn't negate a broad reading. They insisted on a broad reading. So, Boy, let, yeah. Let, let me, um, I mean, I could see obviously that these terms which are used uh, loosely, we will say in the current discourse uh, can have multiple meanings at different times. I wanted to, um, uh, not exactly pivot because we're talking about the same thing. The first in the First Amendment cases, and I know we, if we had more time, we could give many examples. Uh, many people would be surprised at the types of awful things that the Supreme Court has upheld as being protected by free speech. Yes. And I know you have given talks on this sometimes, and almost almost to shock people a little bit, you give the facts of, of some of the things that people have done. And these are all of the, the uh, boundaries of society, whether they go to people's funerals and say things that they're really terrible things, but protected by the, by the uh, First Amendment. Uh, and usually when, when people talk about how could you do this, this is terrible, this is unacceptable. The, an answer that you often hear is that the answer to bad speech is more speech. Or as Justice, I think Brandeis said, the best disinfectant is, is um, uh, sunshine. So yes, we have this terrible stuff, but the general answer is open up the doors, more speech, honesty, truth, that will ultimately win out. And my question is, is that really always the case in our democracy, especially with the new technologies that we have? Um, if you go on Facebook and you can see a literal sewer of hate, bias, and prejudice by the thousands that no one person could possibly combat, no one organization. Uh, we, we, you know, Mark Zuckerberg years ago thought he was creating a, something that would allow people in a dormitory <laughs> to connect with each other. We now have 2 billion people and any one of us on this call could go online right now and find the most extraordinary stuff that thousands of people can connect on. So can we come to a point or have we or might we come to a point where the general answers may not be good enough that in order to preserve the fabric of our democracy, we, meaning not private, but government, may have to take some steps to regulate these new and very powerful social media. Well, I, I, I think that uh, there may well be some greater re regulation of uh, social media. Uh, remember, we, social media is subject to two sorts of very broad uh, legal uh, limitations or, or, or protections. One is the First Amendment. In general, you know, if the government wants to say, you know, you can't put that on, uh, it's too offensive, but you may not. If Congress passed a law saying that, that would very likely be unconstitutional. And what would be unconstitutional as to the print press would likely be unconstitutional uh, with respect to social media. But social media has something else. In order to encourage the development of the internet, Congress passed a law, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, saying in effect, we're not gonna hold Facebook and Google and all these entities liable for what other people say on their their devices, because otherwise they could never know in advance what people are gonna say. And the internet is not gonna grow, so it's, it's not gonna work. So we're gonna treat the internet sort of like a, a company that owns billboards. Uh, that, you know, people put stuff on billboards 
you don't bring lawsuits against the billboard owner. Sort of like telephones, that, that people say things on the telephone which are not constitutionally protected, but then no one, no one goes after the phone company when that happens. Uh, it happens that this law, Section 230, that's not constitutionally required. The New York Times can be sued if, if they take an ad and the advertisement says defamatory things about, about someone where the Times has sufficient knowledge that, it, that it's untrue. The Times has an advertising acceptability department that, that guides them and what ads and not to take. Um, but social media is a world of its own uh, because of, of this, this very successful uh, uh, piece of legislation, successful in leading to the creation of a place where more people can speak to more people with no cost mm -hmm. than has ever existed in the history of mankind. Uh, the other side of that is what Duran was referring to, particularly an entity in which people can be an anonymous, you know, brings out all the, the very worst uh, of, of a society saying sometimes deliberately false things. So what have the social media companies done? What they've done is that, that they, they are being a touch journalistic. They've set standards. They don't publish and, the, and they, they stop publishing as a journalistic group, carrying uh, uh, anti-Semitic speech. That doesn't mean you won't find it, but w when it's on, uh, people report it and they take it down and, and they do that. There are arguments about what's anti-Semitic and what's not. But, but uh, I mean, a racist speech, uh, speech encouraging sexual misconduct with, with children. Uh, there, there are lists of, of, of materials that, that all the large social media entities say that they won't carry and hire many, many people. I mean, Facebook, uh, you know, now has three billion subscribers. I mean, to say that, it's almost unthinkable around the world to have a platform for 3 billion people. And I saw the figure and I don't remember it. And I don't remember if it was 20,000 or, or even more than that, people that do nothing for Facebook other than to, to watch it and see if something is on that shouldn't be on. Now, the uh, final comment. There was a hearing today in front of Congress um, and uh, all the big honchos were represented. All, all the big uh, companies were, were there. And uh, Ted Cruz of uh, Texas said to Zuckerberg, who appointed you to decide what the public sees? That was with respect to Facebook not carrying the New York Post articles about Hunter Biden, which have come up uh, recently. Uh, so so I mean, he, he basically screamed it. I, I haven't heard it, but I heard about it. Uh, you know, who appointed you? Why, why should we have you decide? Well, I mean, That's to some extent, that is the core of the First Amendment because at least my First Amendment and what a, a lot of Supreme Court justices have said that the First Amendment is most about is avoiding governmental control over speech. Let uh, me ask you on, on a, uh, since I know time is short and trying to get as much as I can in there. Uh, to be a First Amendment lawyer is uh, sometimes, maybe often to be unpopular. Uh, sometimes you deal with things that are popular uh, you were a major force in the Pentagon Papers case uh, in the 1970s, one of the great cases in American history, I would say, certainly in 
clearly in First Amendment law. And if we can get to it, we will. But it, it's it's a case that certainly people, uh, maybe older people a little bit, uh, remember very, very well. But then there are cases um, that you have handled that have not been so popular you know, in, in, a, in a political sense. Uh, and I must say, I remember, and we have shared this, very, er very early on in my career, I was asked to uh, uh, represent or to uh, support uh, the city in essentially giving the Black Panthers, who are considered a very dangerous group at the time, a permit to use a public school for a public, for a public meeting. And uh, I was in court defending that I, I, on First Amendment grounds, and the court upheld my position ultimately, it got a lot of publicity and I got a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, quite vicious hate and threatening letters. And you deserved it. And I deserved it, Floyd. I know you've, you have never let me forget it. <laughs> um, but that is something that, how could you? The Black Panthers, uh, people who were threatening to kill um, cops, et cetera, at that time. And uh, uh, the answer was, but in that situation, when they wanted to have a peaceful meeting, and it turned out to be peaceful, there was no basis for denying them access to a public facility such as other groups, etc. We won't go into that. You represented um, the winning side in Citizens United. Citizens United was a five to four decision of the Supreme Court. President Obama, Hillary Clinton, and others have said it was a terrible decision. And if they could, they might, they've even suggested having a constitutional amendment to change it because of what they feel were the results of that for campaign financing and the introduction of huge amounts of money into our political system and what they feel is the corrupting effect that that has on democracy, even, even if there are rich people on both sides. You know, the Koch brothers on one side, Bloomberg on the other, but that's not democracy, they say. And they feel that this in one way or the other was a result directly or indirectly of the Citizens United decision, which you won. Could you tell us, um, and Senator McConnell is the person who sought you as the preeminent First Amendment lawyer to represent their positions. He was right, he won, and you won. Uh, why did you agree to take that case? Why do you think the decision, the five judges correctly decided it, and I know it's a lot of questions, but what perhaps are the one or two greatest misconceptions about what Citizens United did or did not do? I know the average person says, my goodness, how can a corporation be a person for purposes of the First Amendment? Or they may say, how could money be speech? I understand speech is talking, but if somebody gives money, how could that be protected by the First Amendment? I give you those questions. Uh, I think it's important to ha have an idea at the beginning what Citizens United, what the facts were. Uh, a, a quite conservative group, uh, smallish, but important in at that time and, and even now in the conservative world. Uh, did a documentary uh, blasting Hillary Clinton at the time when she was viewed as the likely Democratic candidate for president uh, uh, in, in 2008. Uh, Senator Obama turned out to be nominated. But, but it was a series of people denouncing Hillary Clinton over and over and over and over again. They wanted to put it on uh, pay for view on television. The, the law in effect then, uh, uh, I call the McCain-Feingold law, said that, that you couldn't spend treasury funds, the money that the, the, any, any company owned, corporation, company owned, um, Within uh, 60 days of an election, uh, 30 days of a, of a primary, etc., they were spending their own money from their contributors, but it was their money. Um, and you, and you, can, you couldn't put an ad or a program, but an ad in particular, uh, on television, cable, uh, or, uh, or, or the like within 
short periods of time before an election, which was funded by uh, corporate uh, money. Uh, it would have applied to the ACLU, which supported us uh, in the case, uh, then regretted it, and then came back uh, supporting it again. Um, but my reaction was that there's no sort of speech which is more protected, more deserving and more needful of protection than political speech. And that bans close to elections, if anything, were worse than bans farther from elections. And I never bought into the notion that because it's a corporation, uh, it should have uh, much more limited rights. Now that comes in part from the fact that I had done a lot of work through the years for the New York Times and NBC and other corporations that were engaged in speech. Uh, that I had represented uh, 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 the Brooklyn Museum when Mayor Giuliani tried to shut it down. Uh, and we argued successfully that the Brooklyn Museum was protected by the, by the First Amendment. Um, and that represented colleges and universities who I'd argued on this one successfully that, that I, I have lost a lot of cases, by the way, uh, but but the ones we're talking about tonight seem to be all victories. No, no, it's the only ones. The only ones I selected. Yeah, yeah. So, so look, my 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 reaction was when you're talking about political speech, and the government is the one banning it or greatly limiting it, that in all likelihood it's unconstitutional. And as for saying, well, it's just it's just money. It's not speech. Uh, like my reaction is, if someone said, look, you have freedom of religion, but you can't pay to go to a, uh, to have your child go to uh, uh, a synagogue school or a church school uh, or for something to do with religion, no one would think, no one would imagine that because it was money, it wasn't protected activity. Um, and so that's how I became um, <laughs> in, involved in the case. I um, wanted to ask you something then, just about your own personal experience that I think people may find, find interesting. You have argued before the Supreme Court 13 times. There are probably very, very few uh, lawyers in the country other than those who work in the Solicitor General's office representing the government who, who have that kind of a record. And I'd like to just to tell us a little bit about what it is like to argue before the Supreme Court. I, as an attorney, have argued many cases in front of appellate courts too, seven judges, five judges, but arguing before the Supreme Court is different, I think, for, for a number of reasons. Now, we know that right now, because of the pandemic, they're hearing cases by phone, they've made some changes. And even before that, they made some changes in allowing lawyers to speak for the first two minutes. But what is it like when you go there, uh, amongst other questions, uh, are you nervous? <laughs> Which, uh, you know, every lawyer, I think, has to deal with at one point or another. And when you get up there to speak, at least the way it was until recently, we all have seen the judges asking a lot of questions to each other, over each other. Do you feel that they're listening to you or that they're arguing with each other? And I guess... I would start by asking you to tell something that you told me once. When you were pre preparing for cases, uh, what is the longest amount of time that you were able to start making your opening statements before one of the judges interrupted you? Yeah. Well, uh, so many questions, so little time. I know. <laughs> First, uh, I, thought, I thought one day, of the following that, that it's sort of like a baseball game. The other side's got nine people in the field. The batter's all by himself. The team is rooting for him. Maybe their guy's on bases, but it's one against nine. And that's the way it is in the Supreme Court. Sometimes you have friends, that is to say, people who agree with you on the particular case that that, that you're, you're, you're arguing. 
Um, but but you're always at risk. Of course, you're nervous. Uh, now it's it's the nervousness. I think you know, like someone going on stage. Hopefully, if if you've done it enough times, you know you you're confident enough to think that you can protect yourself and not look too bad about this or that. You know, even if they even if they get you. Uh, uh, one thing I've always thought is that the lawyer ought to know much more about any case than anyone on the Supreme Court. I mean, you know, your case is your child. You know it. They're just reading briefs. You know everyone that's in it, everything that you thought about, about what to argue, uh, and yet about what to argue. Sometimes there are questions which even, even if you've really worked hard and if you're really good and, and you've prepared hard, you just haven't thought of it. I had an argument, I don't know, in the early 1980s representing, uh, I can't even remember what it, what it was, but what it was was a corporation, not campaign finance, but a corporation that had engaged in some sort of speech. And Chief Justice Rehnquist, ask me, does it make any difference that this is a corporation? And my first thought was, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, answer it, answer it, answer it. Uh, uh, and the answer was, it didn't make any difference in New York Times against Sullivan, a great Supreme Court case, uh, when in the New York Times is a corporation. Uh, but I was totally unprepared for the question and irritated at myself, even to this day, for being unprepared for, for, the, for the question. I should have done the work, I, uh, I've come to do it, I've learned the lesson, to find out everything else that is in front of the court at that time. They had a case involving the question of the rights of corporations, for-profit non-media corporations. Uh, to, to spend a lot of money. Uh, this, is, this is long before Citizens United, but to spend a lot of money trying to get uh, certain legislation adopted. Um, and, you know, and so, look, you, you work very hard and it does help to have done it be, before. Uh, they interrupt all the time. Uh, uh, I, I had made a bet before what one argument that I did on a case involving billboards. San Diego banned all billboards in Center City on the ground that they were ugly uh, and that they're diverting for, for drivers. So aesthetics and traffic safety were the uh, articulated uh, reasons uh, for it. Um, how do you prepare? Well, one thing we did was literally to, to send uh, young lawyers to trace this, the, the, from the homes of the Supreme Court justices all the way into the court to see what billboards they saw, of what might, might get them upset, what might get them, uh, 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 they might even like some billboard uh, that they saw. Um, so you, know, you, you, you try to, think of everything they would think of. Now you have one big advantage, uh, that, that they write for a living. They, they write opinions, they write dissenting opinions, they write opinions of one sort or another. So if you know what they've said, at least you know, it, uh, you, you're well ahead of the game. With, with our new Supreme Court Justice, she's been on a court of appeals. She's written law review articles. She signed petitions, no less. Uh, you know, so one one studies that uh, to to make a judgment uh, about you know what can they ask, and I would say most of all you have to know what are, what are the, what are the weak spots uh, in, in your argument. Why why they take this case? Supreme Court here seventy five cases a year out of twenty five thousand that people tried to persuade them to hear. Why, why, why did they take it? And what can I say 
best for my client that will respond to the reason that they took the case. So Floyd, let me ask you, and I know we're getting to the end of our time, in talking about dealing with the unexpected or with the brand new, uh, the technology that all of us have been exposed to in the last five, 10, 20 years is extraordinary. We would not have imagined it uh, before that, and it's happening almost on a daily basis. Uh, I know that you have a matter that you have started working on recently that I think the people here might like to hear a little bit about. I can say with absolute certainty that when you went to law school and when I went to law school, we did not take a course in facial recognition technology. Right. And the kind of extraordinary algorithm that would allow a company to casually find 1 billion photos in LinkedIn and all over the world and create a database that could then be used to identify anybody walking in the street is something that sounds like beyond science fiction. Uh, but here you are working with potential First Amendment implications of this case. Could you tell, uh, tell us a little bit just what it is, the case has just started, but I think when we discussed it, I find I found the issues and the facts here fascinating mm -hmm. as to uh, an absolute cutting edge technology and how the First Amendment language from, from 1790 might apply to it. Let me say first that it's a sort of ironic that I, who was screaming at Zoom before <laughs> we started this tonight, should yeah. be the one who's involved uh, in this case. <laughs> This is what my client does. They have accumulated about 3 billion, with a B, 3 billion photographs, which have been posted on the internet. People take pictures, put it on the internet. There's a way to do that, which keeps it private, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about photos put on the public internet as to which in general, the law is, no one has a right of privacy to, to have a picture that the person takes and puts on the internet. And people have, have brought lawsuits and they always lose them on the grounds that there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in that sort of situation. But this is what my client does. By the use of uh, new technological tools, and algorithms, search engines, translating a picture. There's no room for 3 billion pictures anywhere, but you can, you can put it into a computer and bring it out in computer language, tiny computer language. And then what they can do and what they do do, mostly for their clients are, are essentially law enforcement agencies. So the FBI retained them. New York City Police Department has retained them. Uh, and what they do is to receive a picture from a law enforcement agency and do the same technological breakdowns of it by you know, parts of the face and this and that. And it all comes out in computer speak inside a great computer. And when they get it, so within seconds that they get a photograph that somebody sends them and they can answer the question, are there other photographs of that person which, which have been posted on, on the internet? Now, you know, for someone my age, that would be pretty safe because I don't use the internet in that sort of way, uh, but the world does. Um, and so on the, the good side in a way, uh, some people who have, who have kidnapped kids have been caught uh, because their picture could be identified uh, from older pictures of them where the police have a picture of someone running away that even a, a slight picture the, the danger of it, of course, uh, is, is the way I am told that it is sometimes used in communist China now, 
where you know they have pictures pictures of everyone and they know where you're going and what you're doing and so the 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 competing interest here the interest certainly is a privacy interest uh where certainly someone could say well look i understood that i was taking a picture or a picture of me was going on the internet i never imagined uh that that uh, you, you were going to make a facial creation from my face from the picture, which you could use or anyone could use any time uh, uh, in, in the future. Now, why is the First Amendment involved in that at all? The First Amendment is involved because the Supreme Court has said and said quite recently that information is speech. The Supreme Court has said that the creation and dissemination of information is protected by the First Amendment. And so that sort of thing is what we are uh, citing, arguing in this case, which is really quite new uh, in part because the technology uh, is, uh, is quite new. Uh, the New York Times ha had an article in uh, January of last year, I think, uh, a magazine article saying the little company that may destroy privacy as we know it. <laughs> uh, that article led to a lot of litigation from people who'd never heard of this quite small uh, company um, and ultimately uh, led them to retain me to make this sort of First Amendment arguments that uh, uh, may, you know, may or may not succeed in the case. A last question. Um, uh, I think it's the last one. The, um, in France, they enacted something called the right to be forgotten. And uh, if, if you're 15 years old and you were picked up for marijuana and now you're uh, 70 years old and uh, somebody can Google you and find that 60 years ago, you had this little uh, blemish on your record and it never goes away under the current technology. And France and some other countries, they feel that uh, there's something fundamentally wrong about allowing one little uh, wrong turn in your life to be forever preserved there and perhaps do you damage. So they created a right to be forgotten and people can uh, make applications and petitions. And, and if they're correct, Google is required to, I think, erase, let's say that reference of your marijuana uh, offense from uh, 1942 or whatever. Could something like that ever happen in the United States? Well, there, there are people who've urged it. Uh, um, I don't think that the Supreme Court uh, would say it's, that it is constitutional. I, I think what the court would say is truthful speech is almost always protected that by definition, we're talking about uh, tr truthful speech here. Um, now, the fact that in your hypothetical, it's a 15 year old may, may change things. Uh, we, don't, we don't know yet. Here's the most recent case that, that, uh, that, that got to an appeals court in England. This is all of Europe, by the way, the entirety of Europe. Um, uh, two separate businessmen were each convicted of crimes. Um, uh, one of them was uh, hiring a private eye to follow someone in a way that violated the, uh, the law in, in England uh, because he didn't just follow him. He did a variety of things which intruded on the person's privacy and which were illegal uh, in, in England. Um, and another was a a businessman who played around with his accounting in a way that led him to be uh, jailed. Both of these people went to jail uh, for six month like sentences. Uh, that's reflected on Google. If, if you put in their, their name, that's what you'll find. And in America, that's the end of it. It happened, it's true. Uh, and in fact, it's court records, if anything, even more protected as a generality. But 
there are obviously other interests, interests that I don't think our courts would say trump the First Amendment, but a privacy interest. So in England, these two companies came in front of their highest court, and one of them won and one of them lost. And the, the one that won was because the judge thought there was no likelihood of the crime being repeated and that it was a number of years before. And in the other one, it was someone who had lied to the court, et cetera. It was almost as if this was part of sentencing. So you have cases all around Europe where people ask Google to, to uh, delete something and they, they deleted millions and millions of, of, of listings because of these requests. Um, uh, and, and in most cases, they say no. Uh, uh, and when, when we're talking about crimes, because of the nature of the crime or the nature of the person, about a politician, that they, they would not drop something uh, about the politician's youth, but about someone who was in one thing for one time. So a case in Belgium came up. Someone had driven a car recklessly. Another person had been killed. Uh, the, the person was convicted of their equivalent of reckless homicide. I don't know if he went to, uh, went to jail or not, but it's the only bad thing and surely the only criminal thing that he ever did. And it was his only Google listing because it was the only public thing that the person had ever done. He asked Google to take it down and they said, no, this, is, this was a crime. These are court records. Uh, we think uh, we have the right to <coughs> leave it in and in Belgium, Google lost. Here, I'm confident Google would win. And that's, that's, the, that's the difference between democratic countries with, with respect to just how far they go in protecting uh, freedom of speech. Final question. In 1971, you were a young lawyer with your current firm and uh, what has come to be known as the Pentagon Papers case began at that time when it was become a part of legal history since that time. It was the Vietnam War. Uh, the Defense Department, the Secretary of Defense had asked for a secret study to be done within the department about exactly how they got into the war, the strategies they used, et cetera. And uh, a person named Daniel Ellsberg who worked in the Defense Department had access to it, was very disturbed by what he found and ultimately leaked it to the New York Times and I think another newspaper. The New York Times published in, in a, I think it was in May of 1971, the first of what was gonna be five long articles from these secret documents. And uh, that's when President Nixon and Attorney General Mitchell uh, started the litigation that became the Pentagon Papers case. And that's when you got involved. Uh, just without going to the history of the case, how did the case end and why is the result of that case important to us today, uh, 50 years later? So this is a case that in which the government was arguing, we're in the middle of a war, the American prisoners of war that are being held and if you publish these secret documents, we're about how the US got into the war. It's mostly historical in nature. But if, if you publish it, it may interfere with our ability to get our POWs back, and it may interfere with uh, our prevailing in, in the war. Um, the position of the New York Times was, we spent three months cleansing this document with the help of people who were in the Defense Department, the CIA and elsewhere, of anything which is actually potentially harmful. Um, so the government went to court and said, as Doron said, uh, you shouldn't be allowed to publish this. We need an injunction, a prior restraint as the lawyers call it, 
against publishing any more of this top secret. And it was listed, every page had a stamp on it saying top secret. The New York Times said the First Amendment is particularly uh, strong as a barrier against the government when it tries to stop speech in advance. Uh, it's one thing when the government says, you, you shouldn't have said that and you go to jail, but, it, but to say you can't say it, particularly where it is about the most controversial issue that was then around the, an ongoing, very controversial war that we were losing and didn't know how to get out of. <coughs> um, and so that was the case. Now, we won the case. It was a six to three vote. And the court very briefly, it came up very quickly and was decided very quickly. And the court basically said that, that for the government to get a prior restraint, an injunction against the publication of truthful information by the press requires an enormous showing. And in this case, it requires a showing that publication will surely interfere with the prosecution or coming to an end of the war. And the court said that, that this document was not like that. It was not that dangerous. They also said, we're not gonna answer the question of what would happen if there was a criminal prosecution against the Times for publishing it. We don't have to answer it and we won't. Why is it important? It's important because it, it led to two big results. One is that with a single exception, no president has gone to court since 1971 when President Nixon did. No president, no matter how angry he was, no matter how much he thought they shouldn't be allowed to publish this, etc. None of them have, have gone to court seeking an injunction with the exception of President Carter who went to court on an article published called How to Build an H-Bomb, in which the, the article purported to say out loud for the first time, what the writer of the article said everybody, everybody who would care about this knew, which was how to build an H-Bomb. Uh, the government went to court and said, look, the right to life is more important than anything. This can lead to the most terrible results. Um, now, what happened in that case was that while the case was before the court, it was shown that it had been published elsewhere. But it wasn't that what, what they published wasn't really a secret for, any, for anyone that wanted to know it. And that therefore uh, it was already out. And so the government uh, wound up dropping the case. <coughs> But what, but what the Pentagon Papers case did was to really teach the people who advised the presidents that it just isn't worth it to go to court to try to stop the press, press from printing something. And the second thing it did <coughs> was to establish with great clarity that it's really so hard to get a prior restraint against the press that in other cases, where, a, for example, a criminal is a, someone's mm -hmm. accused of being a criminal. And in England, if the press were to publish the fact that he had a criminal record, that would be a contempt of court. In the US, that's protected by the First Amendment. And it would be even more protected by the First Amendment if the government went to court first and said, we don't want you to be able to publish because it can be prejudicial one way or the other in the case. We don't want you to publish it. And, and the court has made it near impossible to get a prior restraint against publication of what I'll call public information, information obtained publicly uh, in, in the United States. So it was a, it was a big deal. Well, at that time, uh, if you somebody would have told you that uh, in 2020 you would be handling a facial recognition case, I think um, you would have thought that they were from outer space. 
Floyd, thank you very much. I think Welcome. this discussion um, shows us many things, but it shows us two things very clearly. One is why the First Amendment is so central to our lives in this country, to our democracy, why it's also so complicated, why it's also so disputed at times because of the effects that it has on us. And the second, I think, is why um, Senator Moynihan was correct when he said that um, Floyd Abrams is the most significant First Amendment lawyer of our age. I think you've had uh, a little bit of an, of an ex exhibit and an exhibition based on his experience and his insights of just how much he has contributed to the law. And in doing so, I would say to American democracy. Thank you, Floyd. Thank you, and thank you all for attending. I thank uh, everybody for attending. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. That's up to you, gentlemen. Uh, well, I think we are certainly, uh, I mean, we're willing to take them. I'm sure, I'm sure Floyd is, but if people want to stay longer and ask, by all means. Okay, then I will, I will shortly uh, uh, unmute, but I'm going to ask, please, uh, we can only take a couple of questions as time is running short, but it's practically over time. Uh, I will ask you, please, when you ask your question, please don't make a speech. Please limit your question to approximately 15 to 20 seconds. That's about it. We want to hear from the presenters. Keep that in mind. That's what's important here. Uh, I do see two people who have their blue hands up, so I'll call on them first. There were some chat questions, but most of them, I believe, were covered uh, in the conversation. So the first one is Fred uh, Endelman. I'm going to unmute you, Fred. And you'll need to do that as well on your end. Thank you. And you please ask your question in a very brief manner. Yes. So Floyd, um, under the letter of the law, the letter of the Constitution, uh, no matter how uh, jagged the road may be, that on, at noon on January 20 of 2021, we do not yet have a president. Um, is that possible with the current wording in the Constitution? And secondly, the Constitution says um, at noon, the president's term is over. What happens? So if we come to this very weird outlet, what happens at 12.01 on January 20th? I don't know. Uh, right. It, it's a hard. <laughs> um, Where's your crystal ball? Okay. Look, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the second part of, of, of that part of the Constitution that you said, uh, I'm confident will govern, which is to say President Trump is no longer the president. The question is, who is? Uh, whether, I, I mean, I can't posit hypothetically what has happened to, to lead to this, it could then go to the House of Representatives for the, for the House to vote, each state getting one vote as to who the president is as a result uh, of the last election. Uh, I mean, that, that is the only thing the Constitution says about sort of what, what happens if everything is, is, is undecided. Uh, fortunately, uh, we, we have never had that. Uh, I must say that a decision of, of the Supreme Court today, which re refused to step in with respect to uh, voting in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said that uh, there ought to be a, any ballot that was sent before uh, election day which gets there within three days has to be counted. Uh, I think the Supreme Court with pure conservative against pure liberal votes is gonna say that, that the lower court did not have the right to do that. Uh, and that if a state wants to have a system where yes, they have absentee votes, voting by mail, but they don't count them if they don't get in by election day, that that's, that's constitutional. I think that's wrong, but but uh, I think that is where the conservatives on the court are now, uh, and what uh, what they would do. Thank you. The next uh, person who had their hand up was Lance Adelson. I will unmute you now, Lance. Thank you. Go 
Go right ahead, please, okay. briefly. All right. uh, Mr. Abrams, the NAACP, the case, the NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware in 1982 was decided eight to nothing, saying that a boycott is freedom of speech. I am not a supporter of the BDS movement, but how can New York State be justified in saying that it's illegal to boycott uh, the BDS movement or the BDS movement to boycott? Uh, first, I don't think it is constitutional to, to, to ban the speech that leads to boycotts, uh, the on-campus uh, speech or the like. As, as to whether, as to what the court would say now um, about whether a, a boycott itself uh, may be uh, subject to uh, limitations. Um, it, I mean, the, the law is not, not in my mind clear. I do think that, that a, a lot of the statutes which have been passed aimed at the BDS movement will be held unconstitutional. The uh, that ones that are uh, on uh, on campus uh, in particular. Um, now the Supreme Court has affirmed leg uh, legislation which is foreign policy oriented to keep people from doing certain things which interfere with American defense or foreign policy. And depending on what the, what the case may, may be, that, that may be a, a way around the, the pretty clear bar uh, uh, in, in general, uh, or uh, uh, not bar, the, the pretty clear protection, as you say, uh, from that case. Um, I mean, cases come up. I, I don't think it. I I view it as still a developing area of law. Uh, uh, when when Jewish groups said to a hotel in New York that they had better not take uh, uh, Jews for Jesus, and 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 do a uh, uh, a luncheon, a Jews for Jesus luncheon. Um, uh, at that time, they lost that case. The, the case will, the, the, uh, the barring of the Jews for Jesus uh, lunch as a result of the sort of pressure that was put upon the hotel was held to be not protected by the First Amendment. But that did not go to the US Supreme Court. So, you know, we're, we're just not any shorter than I am in answering your, your question. Thank you. Next question is from Marlene and Barry. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the question I had is, uh, what's your thinking about uh, local, state, and federal mandates to wear a face mask as a First Amendment issue? Right. Uh, a few different sorts of issues come up in those cases as I just, just to, to, to move toward your question, a number of cases have come up where governors on their own have required face masks or limited uh, speech, uh, carrying guns in certain areas, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, the, and the state courts or lower federal courts have basically said, well, the governor didn't have the power to do it, the power because no legislation enable the governor to, to do it. That's not what uh, you're asking me about. Uh, my view is that it is highly likely that uh, legislation uh, duly adopted by states requiring face masks at a time of the pandemic would be held constitutional. Um, um, and I think that should be the answer also, but, but I think in any event that it would be the answer. Um, now there, there are, you know, a, there are a lot of, a lot of things going on, um, about what sort of limitations can be placed. And it's almost, a, almost a harder question than, than the one that, that, that you ask, what, what sort of limitations on protests 
may 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 be made because the protests by their nature, <coughs> people getting too close, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, there, I think it, I'm pretty confident it would take a showing by the state that there was no other way but, but a bar from, from protecting the public. As for example, a requirement to wear masks, as opposed to saying, we, you know, we, we don't want a California uh, a statute. You know, we don't want 10,000 people together. That's perfectly understandable. We, we, don't, we don't want them there in a state park. And the, and the answer that was sought by the civil liberties organizations in views that I shared was that if there was any way other than a ban of the protest <coughs> to accomplish the end, the health end, whether it was masks or re re requirement of spacing uh, that 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 they would have to use that rather than the broader uh, uh, bar uh, on on people uh, at all protesting in the area. So you wind up with cases. We've had cases already in the Supreme Court where uh, in uh, Nevada, where gambling is legal, uh, uh, the governor imposed a limitation of no more than pretty sure it was 500 people in a room. Um, and a Pentecostal church sued and said, you're allowing casinos, well, Nevada, you're allowing casinos to have 500 people in each of 10 rooms where you know perfectly well people move from room to room and they're never gonna enforce this right and we can't fill our church uh, with people, etc. That was a five to four opinion uh, on a stay, uh, an application before the Supreme Court would decide it finally. But a five to four ruling written by the Chief Justice saying, look, we defer a great deal to local communities and states about what to do to protect health uh, and, you know, we assume they're going to enforce the law. If, if the law treated every, everyone the same, 50 people, 500 people, uh, in, in New York, that we have situations uh, where, where the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, they, the Hasidim in Brooklyn went to court saying what you've done by limiting the amount of people at a funeral and in a synagogue was unconstitutional. And so far that they, that they have lost in that case. I will allow two more if you don't mind. I'm gonna call on Martin Rosengarten and then uh, Steve Dix. So Martin, I'm unmuting you now. Okay, I'm not sure if he's there. Okay, we will go to Steve. Steve. I'm here. I'm oh, here. Go ahead. Please yes, ask your question I briefly. Just, uh, is it protected speech if the uh, on the internet the Ayatollah says death to Israel and death to anyone who uh, characterizes or uh, brings up anything ab about uh, the prophet, the prophet Muhammad? I think the way a court would analyze it here. <clears throat> is to ask the question, is this what we lawyers call uh, a genuine threat? That is to say, is this just a way of denouncing in the strongest language possible? Or is this a, a genuine threat that if, if you go here and say that or do that, uh, you, you can be uh, uh, You'll be you'll be harmed. In general, uh, language like that would be protected uh, 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 by by the First Amendment. Um, at some point, it can be deemed to be an incitement. We don't protect incitements. 
but what we mean by incitements, the, the court has said, is speech which directly advocates, uh, purposefully advocates illegal conduct with a high likelihood that it will occur. And the last part was put there by, by the court, basically to protect people that use language. I mean, the case came up, a hospital worker standing outside a hospital when President Johnson was visiting, visiting the hospital and who was heard to say, I would kill him or I'm going to kill him. Well, the Secret Service is all around as they should be. No gun, no this, no that. Um, and, uh, you know, in that context, the speech was understood to be rhetorical, rhetorical sort of overflow rather than a genuine threat to kill the president. Thank you. Uh, Steve Dix with our last question. I'll give me a moment here to find Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, going back to the, uh, the Citizens United decision, would Citizens United as written preclude legislation that put a dollar limit on the dissemination of speech in an election cycle? So, yeah. okay, yeah. It, would prevent, it would prevent a dollar limit? Yes, it, it would pre prevent a dollar limit on how much you spend. It would prevent a dollar limit on how much uh, a corporation spends. Now, there are limits on contributions. The, 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 the court for various reasons has treated contributions different than expenditures. So, uh, you know, our former mayor has spent over $100 million in Florida uh, right now uh, uh, supporting uh, the Vice President Biden. There, no, no law limiting that, except if, if, if they were sort of dumb enough or ill-advised enough to, to give it to Biden or his people. But if they spend it, it's, it is unlimited, yes. And that was before Citizens United. Yeah. Well, again, I wanna thank our presenters, uh, Mr. Gobstein and Mr. Abrams. It was a fantastic session. I wanna thank again, Les Agassim for putting this together. I want to thank all the participants, uh, everybody who was on for, I hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to make a donation in honor of the presenters, uh, please go to fjmc.org slash donate. And we get thank you one, one and all. This will be available online. Uh, I will be sending the uh, link to the recording out to those who registered in the next day or so. And again, I thank everyone for participating and wish you all a very good, good night and safe, uh, good health to everyone. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Doron. Floyd, we'll continue the discussion later, Floyd. <laughs> <laughs>